Siamo on air. Allora, salve a tutti, gentile pubblico di Liberi Oltre, ben ritrovati. E, um, oggi abbiamo uh, um, due ospiti, um, uno molto ricorrente che è Monique Camarra, che avete imparato a conoscere Um, dato che viene spesso a trovarci per parlare di, eh, di, di informazione, di campo informativo in Russia e in Ucraina, in generale di, di attualità. E abbiamo anche un ospite d'onore, Madi Kapparov, giornalista investigativo. Ehm, e il tema di oggi sarà l'opposizione russa. Eh, parleremo un po' di che cos'è l'opposizione russa, come funziona, quali sono i eh, gruppi principali riconducibili all'opposizione russa. La conversazione sarà in inglese, dato che Madi ehm, par ci parlerà in inglese. Eh, speriamo di riuscire a, a fornirvi anche degli ottimi sottotitoli. Non posso ancora garantire niente, ma nel frattempo lancio la sigla e dopodiché eh, ci rivediamo per la nostra conversazione. Okay, here we are. So, uh, thanks again, Monique and Madi, for accepting my invitation. Uh, Monique is a, a long-time guest of our channels, Liberi Oltre, and Madi Kaparov is our guest of honor. And um, uh, today's conversation is going to be about uh, Russian opposition. What is Russian opposition? What are the most prominent members of the Russian opposition? And um, Uh, what are the goals of those different people and organizations? But uh, firstly, um, Monique, I'll uh, let you introduce our guest of honor. Oh dear, excellent. Uh, <laughs> oh, he's smiling, that's wonderful. Okay, <laughs> Madi and I are colleagues. Uh, Madi is a uh, Mr. Kaparov, is a PhD student in economics, actually, no, accounting. Correct. That is true. Right. Yeah. And he has um, a very, very wide range, let's say, of interests, especially in uh, everything to do with the war, okay, that we are seeing the reinvasion of Russian, right, in Ukraine. Um, Madi, correct me if I'm wrong, you were also, you were born in Kazakhstan, correct? Yes, that's correct. Yes. Yeah, that's right. Okay. And now he's in London, okay, studying his PhD. Uh, and contributing, all right, through research into different areas, you know, that we both share, okay, I met Madi through um, our own research interests uh, on Russia and on Ukraine, and also extending that research into areas that, um, let's say, what we normally don't look at, which is all of the other area, all of the countries and all of the, re let's say, the, the republics, that make up what the Russian Federation actually is. So that's how we started talking also about the Russian uh, quote unquote opposition. And Madi uh, has helped me through this period to be able to understand not only Madi, but also other analysts as well, to be able to understand exactly what is, let's say what we call in the West The Russian opposition, because we use our own terminology to be able to describe political movements and what we see, but sometimes it doesn't always match with what is the reality of what is happening uh, in Russia, in the Russian Federation, and also its relationships with 
uh, let's say, neighboring countries as well. So this is a really important topic. Thank you, Alexei, for inviting uh, Madi to come on and also for allowing me to listen because Madi is the expert on this kind of stuff. So I'm very happy to give whatever I can to the conversation or even ask questions, but I'm here to listen, okay, as well. All right. So I'm giving it back to you, Alexei. Yeah, thank you. So uh, this conversation is going to uh, develop uh, with uh, some descriptions that I hope Madi will provide about uh, some groups or uh, single people uh, that uh, we in the West call Russian opposition and then some questions or discussion can follow. So let's start with uh, the most prominent ones, uh, the one that we in the West um, learned about so much in the past years. And it's going to be obviously Alexei Navalny and uh, his entourage, his um, uh, FBK, Fond Barbis Karupci, uh, which is his uh, organization. And um, He's now uh, lately gone pretty, I don't know, liberal, if we can say, but the man has some dark past. So, Madi, what can we tell us about him? About him? Sure. So, Alexei Navalny started his career with uh, the party Yabloka uh, under the leadership of Yavlinsky in the 90s. Uh, but over time, he realized that uh, maintaining his position in the, in the party was probably not going to yield him um, a lot of brownie points. So he moved on with more uh, extreme right-wing messaging uh, in Russia. He took part in a number of far-right rallies called Ruski uh something what people don't realize is that when you translate it in English, some of the parts of the messaging is actually lost. You just call it a Russian march in English, but in reality, uh, the exact translation is an ethnic Russian march, meaning that it's a march only for the white Russians of Russia, the Russian Federation. Um, it's frequently admitted in the Western press that he was not merely an attendant. He was also one of the key organizers for a few years. Um, so you'd see him waving, uh, some of the posters, producing some of the interesting speeches on those rallies. Uh, those rallies would extensively feature the Russian imperial flag, the same flag that is used by the uh, FTO foreign terrorist organization called the Russian Imperial Movement, an organization that is recognized by the United States government and by Canada uh, as a terrorist organization. Um, it didn't just end there. Uh, he also produced a number of uh, xenophobic videos calling himself a true Russian national patriot and a nationalist. In 2013, he decided to distance himself from this um, far right movement in Russia and decided to go mainstream. Uh, in 2013, he took part in the Moscow mayoral elections. He didn't win. Um, but what is interesting is that despite having a corruption allegations and investigations into him uh, related to uh, Kirov Kiro uh, if you're curious, you can look it up, um, he still managed to get take part in those elections. Uh, which means that he probably had some protection from the people in the federal government, uh, because without having anyone say so and having an, investig an active investigation, a criminal investigation into the person would simply not be allowed by Russian law. Uh, so in this past is conveniently removed. People think that he moved on from this. Uh, the, one of the biggest tell-sell signs was probably also the 2008 the Russian invasion of Georgia, uh, where he extensively uh, used um, derogatory language addressed at ethnic Georgians of Georgia, at the country of Georgia. Um, his behavior online was also uh, quite graphic, so to speak, uh, using a lot of racial slurs, using a lot of derogatory language uh, against the uh, sexual minorities in Russia. Um, and the most interesting thing is that most of those posts, most of those articles, what he wrote in the past, are still online. It doesn't take much time to actually find them if you just put in the correct key, uh, keywords in search engines for, in Russian, for example, Yandex. It's mm -hmm. all still there. And he never retracted any of those statements. He never apologized. 
Um, he just, well, many people just assume that he's a different person now. Um, I don't know. Is he? Yeah. I don't think so. Maddie, in yep. I think there's even a famous um, there's a famous interview that he did. Was it in 2015 or 2016? Yeah, uh, which is quite surprising. Yeah. yeah, I watched yeah. it and I said, "Oh my god!" Uh, because do you really? I mean, has he come out and said, "Okay, Crimea is Ukrainian or not?" Not explicitly. Uh, and this is extremely problematic because now that uh, this the wars started in full scale in earnest without any pretense or any any deniability on February twenty fourth, twenty twenty two, the most obvious political thing to do would be just to come out and explicitly say, "Hey, Russia has been occupying all of these Ukrainian territories, and Crimea needs to return to into the uh, in, in, into Ukrainian possession." Uh, territorial integrity of uh, Ukraine needs to be restored. He hasn't done it. Uh, he did say uh, that Crimea is not a sandwich. It's kind of a, it's a bit of a meme now. It's not, yeah. uh, he, he claims that, yes, uh, the referendum that was conducted there was probably legal, so we need to redo the re re referendum in Crimea. However, this is a very problematic statement because, and he, he, he fully understands it, um, Redoing a referendum in Crimea implies that all the current residents would get to vote. But the problem is that the current residents came from Russia since 2014, and the local residents, the Crimean Tatars, the ethnic Ukrainians, were displaced. Anyone who was not happy with the occupation of the peninsula by the Russian forces and by the Russian Federation was either imprisoned or forced out of the peninsula. So if you conduct a referendum right now, as it is, I think the outcome is going to be obvious. Uh, yeah. Besides, uh, from a legal standpoint, if you have a uh, an agreement from 1991 clearly demarcating the borders between the two countries, why should there be a referendum in the first place? The territory, uh, as per the international agreement that was signed in 1999, uh, 1991, belongs to Ukraine. There's no need for a referendum. Russia just needs to get out, and yeah. he hasn't said that. They should just go back to their 1991 borders. What was what was arranged at that time? Are exactly. there any are there any figures in let's say because I think one thing Alexei maybe we can agree on this. We should maybe talk about let's say the the opposition to Putin. Okay, let's make it very specific yeah. in Russia yeah. if that exists, and also what is happening abroad with the diaspora. Because there's a lot yeah, of, of movement. I think that I, I read somewhere that in terms of the Russian diaspora, and, and Alexei and Madi, you can correct me if I'm wrong on this. I think it's number three in the world, I read, for the Russian diaspora abroad. Okay, so One of the largest, yeah. it's a huge, yeah. exactly, it's a huge community, very much. And it has been since... 1917, when most of the white Russians, right, fled, uh, fled Russia. So yep. maybe we should divide it into two. And that way, we're, we started with Navalny. Madi, can you continue with maybe some of the other groups? Like I think, Alexei, you had mentioned Yashin, for example, yeah. Um, yeah, and other people as well. Yes, uh, of, of course we will talk about um, about them, but but firstly um, let's uh, close the Navalny chapter. Um, so let me be uh, devil's attorney for a second. This is not my position, but I just want to to make a point that I saw uh, on the internet in uh, public opinion on the West. So um, many people understood uh, during the uh, twenty. 13, 2016, 17 period that Navalny still wanted to access uh, elections and he still thought, at least um, based on, on his behavior, uh, political behavior, that he uh, wanted to get in elections and he wanted to try to win some elections. If uh, Correct me if I'm wrong, but he um, tried to um, to participate in the elections as mayor of Moscow uh, in 2018, maybe, or 16, I can't remember, but um, you can correct me if uh, if I'm wrong. So, again, um, 
uh, Russian public opinion was uh, totally biased uh, during um, the the annexation of Crimea period, and there was a strong support towards the annexation. So. Uh, is it possible to think that uh, Navalny did this, uh, did implicitly support annexation of Crimea because he still wanted to be relevant politically and um, have access to elections and get eventually elected somewhere in Russia? Yeah, you bring up a very uh, valid point, and that applies not just to Alexei Navalny, it applies pretty much to every a uh, prominent figure that is not in the Kremlin but wants to have a bid for power in Russia. Uh, they would not, pretty much none of them would explicitly call Russia an imperial power. None of them. Because the moment they do, um, the general Russian population, the general public would pretty much dismiss them as a, an invalid candidate or someone who's there to damage Russia's national interests. Because at the end of the day, the Russian Federation, the way it is structured right now, the way it's organized, starting from political institutions and ending with the economic structure, it is still a, an imperial power. It's the last remaining European empire and a colonial empire that it did shrink in 1991 a bit, uh, but it never fully finished. Uh, frequently people, uh, and sorry, it's a bit of a side note, but pre people frequently think that all of the European colonial powers had their colonial possessions overseas. But there's another example in Europe, well, partially in Europe, that, uh, that fits the bill as well, or used to fit the bill, is the Ottoman Empire. After the defeat in World War I, they decolonized. Uh, in the case of the Russian uh, Empire, it didn't happen. It just got reimagined into a different variation called the Soviet Union. Um, all right, so going back to uh, Navalny and his speeches, why he's not explicitly um, supporting the restoration of U Ukraine's territorial integrity. Yeah, you're right. Partially, it's probably driven by the fact that he wants to have a decent chance at, of ever taking power and, 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 or assuming any kind of office in the, in the government. But at the same time, uh, people need to keep in mind that in Russia, uh, the true opposition is not exactly feasible because for opposition, you need proper financing. Uh, within the way the Russian economy is structured, financing can either come from two sources. It's either going to come from the federal government uh, through federal funding, and I'll give you an example a bit later, or it can come from one of the prominent oligarchs. Um, so at the end of the day, ultimately, both are controlled by the Kremlin. So if there is no access to funding, no access to money that is not controlled by the Kremlin, you're not going to have any true opposition. So going back to the example that is funded by the federal government directly is the Echo of Moscow, Echo Moskvi. That was a very prominent radio station that emerged in 1990, actually before the collapse of the Soviet Union during uh, Glasnost era. And Gorbachev at the time needed to portray the Soviet Union as a country that's starting to have a democratic discourse. Um, that's why Echo of Moscow was born. And after the Soviet Union collapsed, Echo of Moscow actually maintained uh, their access to federal funding, uh, which, is, uh, which is a bit surprising because uh, when people think of Echo of Moscow and, and in Russia, they think, oh, it's uh, Vinodiktov, he's, especially if they're hardcore nationalists, so Vinodiktov is just a crazy person who's super liberal influenced by the West. Well, the man was financed by the federal government, so I don't know why would you think that and say that. Uh, and he's been financed by the federal government for the past 30 years. Um, anyway, so obviously the channel got shut down after the full-scale invasion started because they wanted to climb down and centralize the info space even further uh, to ensure that there's, the system was infallible. Uh, another interesting person that should be mentioned is uh, coming from the same Glasnost era is Vladimir Zhirinovsky, someone who had recently passed away and who was kind of a systemic opposition figure within the Russian uh, state Duma, but in reality, he was not an opposition figure whatsoever. But he emerged in the 1980s, uh, again, during Gorbachev times. Um, of course, there's no definitive proof, but uh, it's been 
it's kind of an accepted fact within the Russian Federation that he was a KGB agent. Uh, he merged uh, the political scene again to create a a facade of democratic discourse and a a kind of an opposition to the existing Communist Party. And how do you ensure that you don't get a, a an opposition figure that is completely out of control and creating a lot of problems for the central government? You put someone who is actually one of yours. You put in a KGB agent. Uh, I'm pretty sure the uh, uh, the uh, the FSB and the FSK actually the FSK actually the collapse of the Soviet inherited that relationship with Zhirinovsky, and it kind of carried on. So given that he's he's one of those figures, I don't think he's a one-off. It's probably very common within Russia. Um, that's why with Alexei Navalny, I I actually leave out a, a possibility where he's not a hardcore ultra nationalist. I leave out the possibility that he's could in fact be in one way uh, uh, working with the Russian intelligence services. Uh, yes, he's imprisoned. Yes, he's unlawfully imprisoned right now uh, by the uh, federal uh, penitentiary system in Russia, right? But um, he had a lot of affiliations and associations where he conducted uh, uh, character assassination campaigns uh, in the background um, against other political figures in Russia, including Boris Nemtsov. Uh, there were uh, email hacks. Of, of course, those email hacks are near damn impossible to confirm for veracity. Uh, but email hacks suggest that uh, he collaborated with other prominent journalists within Russia uh, to conduct those operations. Uh, he was also a board member of a Russian state uh, national flagship carrier, Aeroflot. Uh, at the time, Adolf uh, chairman of the board of directors, was a close affiliate and his friend, personal friend of Sergei Ivanov. Sergei Ivanov, just to give you an idea, he's, a, he's an FSB general and a former head of the Russian Ministry of Defense. So there's a lot of circumstantial connections here and there that yeah. might suggest that he's not, he might not be a nationalist after all. He might be. Intelligence, Russian intelligence. So, again, uh, yeah, it's okay. it's borderline conspiracy theory. Of course, many people would point that out quickly. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, with Russia, you never have any definitive proof and definitive evidence at the end of the day. We might yeah. find out the truth in 20 or 30 years after most of these people are gone. Yeah, that's the big problem, right? Yeah, definitely. Is yeah. that with a lot of people that are there, um, we do have big question marks because of the connections that they have, as you've pointed out, Madi, with other, you know, with state run or uh, yep. actually people in the ministry uh, of, of defense. And um, so th it's a bit difficult. It really, really is. That's why I find anytime I see somebody, I stop <laughs> before I tweet yeah. and I say, yeah. okay, let me check. First of all, who is this person? Because, you know, Alexa, it's really hard. You know, and this is not my culture. It's not my it people. Is. And, you know, that's why I defer to people who actually know something about Russians, because that's the only way to do it, you know? So that's uh, that there. Yeah, of course. So um, let's briefly move to to his entourage, uh, the FBK, Fond Baribus Karupci. And uh, especially uh, thank you for mentioning Venediktov. Because of the recent skirmish between uh, Volkov, the chairman of uh, of uh, Navalny's organization, and Venediktov, what was it? And um, also, what is uh, von Baribus Karupci now that is abroad? What can it do? Uh, the diaspora that Monique mentioned earlier. Yeah. Uh, so here's my take, and of course, it's my subjective perception. Uh, this entire uh, debacle between Volkov and Venediktov was just distraction. Because Volkov uh, screwed up big time when he tried to uh, file a petition. Well, he did file a petition asking for the sanctions to be lifted from Alpha Bank. Uh, let's explain what Alpha Bank is. Alpha Bank is owned by two oligarchs, uh, Friedman and Aden. Aden. 
Uh, while Friedman is an interesting oligarch, uh, he's not the key person here. The key person is Piotr Avin. Because in, in the early 90s, Piotr Avin was the uh, Minister of Trade in the Russian Federation uh, following the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, at the same time, Vladimir Putin was just a, a bureaucrat within the uh, within Sobchak's office in St. Petersburg. Uh, Sobchak was the mayor of St. Petersburg at the time. Uh, the interesting thing is that at the time, when uh, immediately following the collapse of the Soviet Union, foreign trade was still technically heavily controlled by the central government. Only the central government could actually issue foreign trade licenses, uh, not the local governments. But Putin, while being a bureaucrat within the, uh, within the uh, mayor's office, was actually giving out contracts and permits for foreign trade to the local companies and firms to supply the city, the city of St. Petersburg. He was in direct of the violation of the federal law. Uh, a criminal investigation was started into him. Uh, he was getting very close to actually losing his position and potentially facing some time um, in prison. And the person who saved him is Piotr Ivan because he was the Minister of Foreign Trade and he backdated a permit uh, allowing specifically for Putin to issue those licenses. So Vladimir Putin is... I had no idea it was Avin. So it was Avin that, that saved yes, him. Yes, exactly. Oh, okay. P P P yeah. Piotr Avin, Piotr Avin yeah. uh, is, is an important figure uh, historically uh, because had he not done it, we might not have Putin right now. We, we might have someone else. Uh, God damn not that me. it would might not even change much, but still, it's a it's a thing. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, Piotr Ivan, uh, Putin owns owes Piotr Ivan uh, a huge favor, and uh, when you consider that through the lens of the past events and look at what happened quite recently with Volkov and many other prominent Russian opposition figures uh, signing the petition to lift sanctions from Michael Bank, you start to realize. What if the order came from straight from the Kremlin or somewhere, somewhere in the orbits? Um, of course, again, I have no proof except for this, but, uh, and again, and many people in the West I know are not very comfortable with making such suggestions, but they, they, given that we're dealing with Russia, we're dealing with, we're dealing with a, an extremely opaque state. We never get definitive proof. We only need to look at the context of past events and interpret uh, current events through the lens of uh, the past. Um, yeah, of because course. Otherwise, in and isolation, yeah, with Volkov uh, as, uh, doing that petition in isolation, it just seems weird. It's like, why would he do that? Like, it's just yeah. weird. Yeah. Yeah, because uh, it is fair to point out that Alpha Bank is also like the biggest corporate raiders in Russia. They have yes. track record doing it, and uh, yeah. we can put it that way, I think. Um, Friedman and Avin are like good cop, bad cop. Friedman is uh, the good guy because he has Russian, uh, sorry, Ukrainian heritage. He has family in, in uh, Ukraine, and he's like the, uh, the one that actually help Ukraine if, theoretically, uh, sanctions got lifted up um, from him. Uh, and Avin is the what you Madi described, but yeah. So uh, Volkov screwed uh, screwed up big time, uh, and uh, this this skirmish was a distraction in your opinion. But apart yeah. of that episode, uh, what else can we say about von Barbeskarupci and what they're doing right now? So with FBK or FBK, um, I have a bit of concern because. Uh, they really like to talk about transparency within the federal government while being non-transparent themselves. Uh, if you try to figure out what their financing is, where it's coming from, uh, all we have is just a few tweets and a few articles here and there where they say that most of the funding is coming from the Good Samaritans of Russia who donate to them on a regular basis or a semi-regular basis. But again, without any, any audited financials, it's it's hard to hard to believe anything, uh, and um, 
again, as, as I said before, uh, when it comes to political motivations and political alignments, it's always important to look at where the money is coming from. In the case of the Russian Federation, it's uh, with these so-called opposition figures, it's usually coming from two sources, either the federal government straight from the federal government or from one of the oligarchs. And uh, over the past 20 years, uh, all of the oligarchs who remain within Russia are fully aligned with the Kremlin. Uh, some of them did flee. Okay. Uh, some of them did flee. We've got obviously Khodorkovsky after his, sorry, his prison time. Uh, he's outside of Russia now, uh, but he's got an interesting past and uh, interesting dealings. Uh, he's kind of a, a very interesting person on his own because he connects a lot of people with each other w within the uh, Russian system of power. Given that we're talking about opposition, it's it's worth noting that he's he's also a very prominent critic of Putin these days, especially after the full scale invasion. But uh, given his past, it's uh, uh, and given that he's uh, not very critical of Russia being a an imperial power and a chauvinist power at that, um, it doesn't seem that uh, uh, he's the kind of opposition that people expect him to be. And on top of that, he's a yeah. oligarch who's done a lot of interesting dealings. I'm sorry for getting sidetracked, but yeah, with FBK, um it seems like they're trying to use, well, it, it doesn't, it, it's, it seems to me, they're trying to use this full-scale invasion starting from February 24th just to uh, get as much attention as possible from the West, and they're succeeding, they're actually succeeding, to get as much attention to, uh, from the West to, their own, uh, to themselves uh, without actually highlighting the plight of the Ukrainian nation. Um, they, they also refuse to even apologize for Alexei Navalny's past st stances on Ukraine. Uh, Alexei Navalny, of course, did not take a, a hard stance on Crimea, making some wishy-washy statements that could be interpreted in a positive light by the most charitable people in the West. But at the same time, people forget that in 2014 and 2015, he gave a number of interviews. And there's an interview to the Washington Post where he openly criticized uh, weapons deliveries, uh, by the way, to Ukraine, saying that, hey, look, these supplies are not going to achieve much. It's going to be a waste of money because they're fighting uh, what amounts to, uh, in his words, at least in my perception, as the mighty Russian army. Uh, their primary concern at the end of the day, for FBK and for many other Russian opposition figures, is just corruption within the Russian Federation. Uh, they don't talk about true democratic reforms. They don't talk about decentralization of the Russian Federation. Uh, there was one article by Alexei Navalny where he explained that, hey, uh, uh, path to future for the Russian Federation is probably a parliamentarian system. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, given how the economy is structured, how everything is centered around Moscow, it's it's doomed to fail. Um, I could explain it, but it's it's a uh, it's kind of an economic stock, so it's perhaps delayed for a bit later. So when you have yeah, no, but figures that, we're still yeah oh yeah, yeah. sorry yeah. when you have a position oh, no, figures ahead. that are uh, primarily focused on talking about corruption primarily focused on talking about a single person within the system who is Vladimir Putin and trying to basically put the blame squarely on him. Um, it doesn't really help, uh, it doesn't really help me, but feel that uh, they're just populists. They're just populists and they're taking advantage of the situation who want you know, to uh, score some brownie points with the West for saying all the right things and blaming all the right people and eventually get a seat at the table when the dust settles. Okay, so very briefly bec uh, before moving on, uh, let's go back to um, people that asks the West to lift sanctions from some oligarchs. Uh, uh, there is one important character to mention in this story, that is Oleg Tinkov. Uh, he is one of the, those guys that fled Russia, that openly declared uh, that they are against the war, that they condemn what Russia is doing. 
everything that they can what what the Putin reg regime is. Uh, so you can comment it briefly, and then we can move on to next uh, major opposition organizations. Yeah. So Alek Tinkov is a man of the system. He's not an opposition figure. He's a businessman. He's a uh, he doesn't really fit the definition of an oligarch, but I'd call myself call him an oligarch. Not in the, he's not an oligarch in the classical definition. Uh, he's a man of the system. He's someone who got, was allowed to operate uh, within the financial system of the Russian Federation. In a country like Russia, in a heavily centralized uh, dictatorship, anyone who gets access or manages to establish major institutions within the financial system has to be collaborating with the Kremlin or their proxies. Because in a dictatorship, when you control the money, when you have a control of even a small portion of the financial system, you control some of the power. So if you're not aligned with the central powers in the Kremlin, you will not be allowed to operate within the financial services sector. So Oleg Tinkov created one of the major banks within Russia, Tinkov Bank. Um, the bank, according to him, uh, as he claims, was nationalized by the Russian federal government. Uh, but keep in mind that he's also someone who made extremely nationalistic claims in 2014 and 2015 when the Russian uh, Federation invaded Ukraine first. He used der derogatory ethnic slurs against the Ukrainians, and it's all there. It's all online. That's what people think that it's once you tweet or once you say something and post online, it's going to stay there forever and it's there. Yeah, of course. Um, yeah, so Alek Tinkov also gave a, an interview to uh, Dud, a, a prominent Russian YouTuber, um, claiming that Vladimir Putin should be crowned Tsar. Of course that was. A few years ago, of course it could be interpreted as sarcasm, but at the end of the day, if you're if you're someone who is so democratic and so liberal, why would you even make a joke like that? Uh, of course, yeah. like, it could be claimed that it's taken out of the context, and he only was making a joke, saying that Putin is a tsar anyway because he made it so. Might as well just make it official. But if you if you're a native Russian speaker and you, you watch that interview, I got the sense that he was actually. Uh, speaking from his heart, my subjective yeah. perception, of course. Yeah, uh, as as a native Russian speaker, yeah, I, I can agree with you. Well, I just hope that uh, the man shows uh, with his deeds and not only with the words that he take uh, the, um, that he has taken the right side. Well, this uh, only time can show us. Uh, if it's going to be the case. But moving on, uh, the second major um, Russian opposition organization is Khodorkovsky and everything that uh, that's connected to him. So you already um, introduced Khodorkovsky. He is a like the oligarch. He um, made his fortune uh, during the 90s, during privatization. He then got... Um, in jail for openly criticizing Putin, and he stayed ten years in jail. Yeah. Or if you have some some objections to what I'm saying, yeah. I will uh, be glad to hear you. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so he he was a member of Komsomol in the '80s. So uh, he was a very prominent member. So he had a lot of established connections within the Communist Party, uh, and he knew how the channels worked when the uh, time of privatization came around. Uh, so when 1991 descended upon everyone, he was just placed in the right position to take advantage of the new era of wild capitalism within the Russian Federation. Um, and as, as this is the time progressed, he established UCAS, one of the major um, uh, oil companies within the Russian Federation. And then 1999 came when Putin became uh, a very prominent figure and he was kind of a consensus person that a small circle of oligarchs and small per uh, circle of people within the Russian power circles settled on to inherit the position from Yeltsin. So uh, Khodorkovsky 
did not exactly get it into a situation where he was openly criticizing Putin uh, because he wanted to criticize Putin. He got himself into that situation because he was not willing to share the riches with the new uh, clique of Siloviki that took over uh, with Putin at the helm. Because we've also got other examples like Abramovich, who was willing to become a a like a money bag for uh, these uh, people from the security apparatus. Uh, Khodorkovsky took a stance. He decided not not, not to become that person uh, because hey, all the hard earned money <laughs> through <laughs> through establishing. Uh, a fortune through a privatization system. Uh, he was not willing to share that, and that's what got him into a position that where he found himself in the early two thousands. So after after he served his prison sentence, he fled Russia, and now he's from beyond Russia. Uh, he's trying to influence the situation within the Russian Federation. Um, of course, if you're a native uh, English speaker and you just follow what he says in English, um, he's messaging his kosher um, for the most part. Uh, he he's criticized Putin, uh, but at the end of the day, what's important to understand is that the Russian Federation is not Putin. Putin is just one of the cogs in the system. He's a symptom of a wider issue within the country. Um, because Putin is only doing what he thinks is, uh, he's going to keep him in power, uh, starting from the general support in the public, ending for the people, uh, running the money systems in Russia. Uh, he learned very quickly in 1999 and 2000 and 2001 that a winning war for Russia means a widespread public support. And of course, I'm talking about the second Chechen war. Uh, his public approval ratings skyrocketed from the low, low 30s all the way into the high 80s. Um, and the same happened in 2008. Of course, he was not the president at the time. He did a little switcheroo operation with Medvedev. Uh, but the public approval rating for the prime minister, because that's what he was at the time, again, uh, it received a healthy bump. Well, I healthy bump, depending on how you want to uh, look at it. Um, and again, uh, the, he, he learned the same lesson after the 2014 occupation of Crimea, uh, because there, is, there was a massive Crimea effect, uh, despite Russia going through a plethora of economic troubles, um, you know, experiencing a significant economic slump, the, uh, the occupation of Crimea, uh, boosted his ratings through the roof. Um, and between 2014 and 2021, 2022, with COVID and other economic issues, his public approval ratings started to uh, slump again. And we got what we got in on February 24th, 2022, the full-scale invasion of Ukraine. Yeah. And it's worth noting that as soon as the invasion was announced, as soon as the war started, a Nevada center, and of course, uh, many people would criticize me, but Nevada Center did point out that his public approval ratings jumped again. While these uh, public approval ratings polls, the numbers themselves, they could be faked. They might not reflect the true situation in Russia, but the trend itself generally is very hard to fake and very hard to fabricate. And in all of the instances, we always have an upward trend with the Second Chechen War, with, with the uh, war in Georgia, with the occupation of mm -hmm. Crimea, and with the follow-on full-scale invasion. It's always an upward trend. So yeah. we, have, we have a bit of a cultural issue here at hand, I think. Um, yeah. yeah. It's funny that you mentioned the, the polling, Mahdi, because I remember talking to somebody about this on how do we interpret, right, yep. the polling and the numbers that we see. And are they faked? Are people not telling the truth? And somebody explained to me, and maybe you can either agree or disagree or tweak it. Somebody explained to me, and also Alexei as well, that it's not that, that people say, I don't want a war. They say, do I like what Putin is doing or I don't like what Putin is doing? That's it. It's not, they are not bringing into question his power, but just 
Do you, do you like what he's doing with this? Do you like this measure? They never, ever question his actual power or the people around him. Would you agree with that assessment? And Alexei? Um, that's... They uh, yes, that's generally the method that they try to apply, and there's a reason for it because if you want to get an honest response from the people in Russia, uh, you cannot put them in a position where they either need to take a stance uh, on Putin or on, on the war, uh, because many people would, um, even those who are apathetic uh, with regards to the entire political mess in Russia and what Russia is doing abroad. They will probably say, yes, I support everything. I support the war and as, uh, because they don't know if they're speaking to an FSB agent or an actual uh, an actual pollster. They, 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 that's why you need to frame a question that would not push them or put them in a position where they feel threatened. Um, so when, that's why I, I think the Levada polls are actually good. Uh, I know a lot of people criticize them. A lot of people don't take them seriously. And some people even say, it's like, hey, they're Russian. You can't trust them. But at the end of the day, that's the best we've got uh, because we don't have a third party uh, Western organization going around and polling anyone. anyone. That's, that's the only one we've got. Um, also, we've got the um, so-called Kremlin polls. Uh, the polls that the Kremlin is organizing themselves uh, on a somewhat regular basis, a weekly by weekly basis. And the Moscow Times about a few months ago published a piece where they managed to obtain uh, the results from uh, from the leaked uh, Kremlin polls themselves. And they noticed that they were observing the same. They were observing uh, an upward trend with people supporting the war. Um, and it seems that uh, the uh, this nationalistic patriotic zealous drive is not going to die down anytime soon until until the uh, the full brunt of economic collapse within Russia is felt. And I know that the economic sanctions have been damaging to an extent, uh, but at the end of the day, an extra sanction has is going to have only a marginal effect. Um, from a Western perspective, uh, the uh, the damage to the Russian economy is devastating. It's going to take years to recover. Uh, but from the Russian culture perspective, especially for those people who lived from the 90s, uh, following the immediate collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, you have to keep in mind, these people, from a, from a cultural standpoint and from a historical standpoint, they've experienced a lot. And they are they're quite resilient. And it's not a praise. It's not because it's not normal to be suffering a dictatorship and be okay with it. Uh, they're quite resilient to hardships. So it's going to take a while for them to actually start understanding what the heck is going on. Um, that's why we don't see any large scale protests in Russia still, despite the economic uh, hardships, despite the uh, many uh, tens of thousands of dead on their side. It's just. It's just hard to comprehend for people in the West. Yeah, I think yeah. it's also no, yeah, it's, can... culture. it's difficult. Yeah, go ahead, Alexei. Sorry. Yeah, it is. It, it is. It is partly Soviet heritage. It is that uh, um, what what is is called um, as a joke, almost Sovieticus, uh, that people got um, deeply traumatized by their Soviet past. So even today are unable to to express themselves freely uh, but uh, this this could be a very interesting uh, discussion but it uh, could um, yeah. it it would require its time let's put it that way so yeah, uh, getting true. back on track on uh, Russian opposition uh, Hodorkovsky the people around him he is uh, in the Russian anti-war committee, he uh, was the leader of Open Russia, um, and uh, he has around him, uh, just as Navalny, uh, some respectable people, like for example Sergei Guriev, which is Provost of yeah. Po, and uh, he is, uh, we could say, one like true, let's not use this term, but good Russian, uh, uh, that he is a uh, truly democrat. I mean, Guriev, but uh, we we mm, will have 
some little time to talk about him. Uh, but firstly, uh, Hodorkovsky, the people around him and the organizations, what are they, what they are doing? And uh, it is fair to point out that they are having a, um, a some degree of success, especially in the diaspora abroad of Russia. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I think what it started off as a... Um, I don't think Khodorkovsky is the figure who wants to take power in Russia. Uh, not at least, he's not the kind of person who envisions himself sitting in the, in the seat in the Kremlin himself. But he's the kind of person who wants to have uh, a say in who ultimately ends up being in power. And that is why he's running this, what he's doing. Uh, you rightly noticed, uh, noted that he has a lot of prominent uh, figures uh, in his organization. Uh, of course, Guriev, um, he's an academic and a very prominent ec economist. Um, uh, I, I don't want to say he's controlled Russian opposition because I, I simply don't know, and I've, and I've haven't seen I haven't seen anything troubling with Gudiev. Most of his economic analysis, when it comes to Russia, is actually very good, uh, and that's why Khodorkovsky tries to attract people like him. Uh, of course, there are other people in orbits of various quality. Uh, uh, there are also some suggestions, of course, suggestions that Khabarkovsky is financing people uh, of oppos oppositional inclinations within Russia itself. Um, I think there was a uh, a recent, uh, not so prominent, but uh, opposition figure in Russia who, who claimed that she got poisoned. And there are rumors out there that he's actually uh, financed by Khabarkovsky. But again, rumors. Uh, so ultimately, do I think Khodorkovsky is someone who wants to be in power in Russia? No, I don't think so. Uh, but he's someone who probably wants to have uh, the doors open back for him for business in Russia. And for that, to achieve that, he needs to have someone who is favorable to him. And that's definitely not anyone who's currently in power or close to power. To the student power circles in Russia. Okay. So, uh, sorry? Hopefully that answers the, uh, the question that you had. Yeah, yeah, it, it does. So, uh, uh, a brief personal comment. Thank you for reassuring me about Guri because I'm a I'm personally a big fan of the man. I think he is a great economist, and I think he is. I hope he is not controlled Russian opposition. So yeah, your words reassure me. Uh, but then um, there are some other figures. Um, I'll I'll so uh, some time ago. A, um, an investigation made by Ukrainian journalists uh, that tried to point out um, Russian opposition and dividing it in two categories, uh, two groups, uh, because um, the term good Russian is wrong on many ways because uh, it, it don't, doesn't mean nothing what is a good Russian and what isn't so Ukrainian journalists they did a, um, a way uh, smarter thing, they divided Russian opposition, useful opposition for Ukraine and not useful, uh, I will uh, probably uh, link the this investigation in the description, I, I find it very interesting, and there are uh, actually very few people in um, in this in the group uh, of uh, useful opposition. Uh, there is uh, Guriev, uh, there is um, lawyer Mark Fagin, which uh, does live streams with Seristovich. Um, there is, for example, Evgeny Chichvarkin, uh, which is a London-based. Uh, Russian emigre uh, that is now a businessman in London and he actually supports Ukraine, he donates uh, um, large sums of money and uh, like uh, humanitarian aid. Yeah, Monique, you, you have part, something yeah, to say? Part of Kasparov's, is he part of Kasparov's group to hold the, Shvarkin, the delegation? Uh, or no? Yeah. Um, uh, no, he's kind of doing his own thing. He's kind of doing his own thing. Yeah. He's, okay. Okay. So yeah. he's not part of basically. No. Okay. 
No. All right. Yeah, he's we'll here discuss, and there. We'll discuss yeah. That. yeah. Yeah, so um, let's discuss briefly those who uh, Ukrainian journalists defined as, uh, again, a useful opposition, like, for example, Guriev that you already mentioned, but also the other two, Fagin and Chichvarkin, for example. Yeah. You um, choose. I, I absolutely agree. The, uh, the definition of a bad Russian or a good Russian is, is really wishy-washy. At the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. I mean, if they represent the Russian Federation, uh, it's highly likely that they're just Russians and they probably align with the with the overall nationalistic views. But sometimes it does happen. It does happen, but it's rare that they they try to undermine the current regime in earnest. I think and I believe that uh, while Gudiev is not actively doing it, but in his own way through academic analysis. Uh, he does produce good work that is potentially useful to, in deciding how to deal with the Russian Federation. Notice that I'm not saying Putin, because we're not dealing with Putin, we're dealing with an entire country. Um, Chichvarkin, this categorization, like, I, don't, I don't know, I don't, I don't agree. I just, he's just there, he, he's on YouTube, he's on social media, and... Uh, I, have I seen him doing anything useful or prominent except for maybe doing self promotion a lot? No. So, uh, with Mark Fagan, partly agree, partly disagree. Uh, he's, uh, his YouTube channel, he's, uh, he's done a lot of interviews, daily interviews for many, for many days, start, since the start of Full Invasion with uh, Aristovich. Uh, but Aristovich is a bit of a controversial figure himself in Ukraine. Uh, perhaps we could discuss like him and other people in Ukraine at a later show, but Aristovich's past is also not clear. Uh, because, yes, I understand many Ukrainians, like, and I might get eaten alive for saying this. I fully realize that, but many people in the West see like, hey, this is a Ukrainian journalist or a Ukrainian politician. They're a patriot and so on and so forth. But it's like, have you looked into their past? Have you seen what they've done? Uh, some of them had a very interesting things to say in the past. <laughs> so, yeah, anyway. So with Adistovich and Fagan, like I'd be careful, very careful categorizing them. Uh, I can't remember. I think the same journalist also interviewed Elia Panamarov, right? He's yeah, going to be the next yes. one. Yeah, we will discuss. Yeah, he's another next. one. He's another yeah. one. Yeah, Mari, tell us who who uh, Elia is. Yeah, Elia Panamarov. Yeah. So he comes of a, from a family uh, 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 of politicians from the Soviet times. He's so in in the uh, in the Russian definition of things. He's a he's an aristocrat. He's an ability. He's he's blue bloods. So he also was also a member of the state Duma for more than eighty years. So he was part of the system. He was also uh, he also worked for Yukas. So that's he's connected to Averkovsky as well. Uh, so. And he ran a lot of rallies and meetings in Moscow. And one of the rallies that he organized, uh, along with other people, he was actually one of the two other people uh, who wasn't arrested and apprehended after the rally. So in, in some way, he was kind of a figurehead within Russia uh, to point out potentially dangerous actors for the Kremlin. Uh, just again, this is not a conjecture. This is actually like what I think he did, judging by the actions, because we also got, uh, and when you can I discussed in the past, like we've got Operation Trist or Operation Trust, that that the the communists did in the nineteen in the early nineteen twenties, organizing a fake anti, a, a fake monarchist movement, uh, amongst the white emigre uh, in Europe and actually within the Soviet Union as well, and they did it to ensure that they managed to identify the key actors, the key threats to the communist regime, uh, the key people among the monarchists. Yeah. And I, I think they're just following the same uh, framework even yeah. to this day. 
Yeah, can I just introduce just for a sec, very briefly? Um, I was just reading. I'm, I'm reading uh, Solotov's uh, "The New uh, The New Nobility," which is a great book, by the way, because it goes all the way back to the Stalin. Okay, when after 1917, after Lenin dies, and it goes through this in this part of the book, it goes through all of the people um, that were involved in the secret services and what their roles were okay in the diaspora abroad and they had two they had the actual um let's say the embassy and the consulate whatever uh official okay russian representation but they also had parallel in everywhere that they could a shadow uh let's say shadow agents that were working illegally they were illegals and they penetrated all of the associations that they could to find uh, other, let's say, opposition figures or anybody who would, okay, um, who would cause problems. That's how they got Trotsky. That's how they got, okay, a lot of other people. And they managed to decimate the, you know, kill right out. I mean, it's not the first time that we've had like the, the Skripal uh, incident and the Bulgarian that was blown up. This has been going on for quite a long time, and it started, okay, very much, let's say, right after Stalin took uh, power in the 1930s when he had to consolidate. This is what he did. So this is, you know, this is the way they operate. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So going back to Panamaryov um, and his uh, stunts while he was in Russia, within, within Russia, um, Allegedly, by his own claim in 2016, he fled Russia because he took a stance and he was not happy with the ratification of the annexation of Crimea. And the reason I don't like using annexation because it's just pure occupation of the peninsula. Um, and um, he took a stance and he fled Russia. He fled to the United States. He lived in California for a bit, about a year at the time. Um, and then he moved to, into Kiev, uh, Ukraine. Um, so a lot of things worth noting, uh, uh, it's worth noting what he uh, was actually saying in 2014, 2015, uh, it's worth digging up his blog posts and they're all online, by the way, what he wrote about the war in Ukraine. Um, at the time he was squarely blaming the regime in Kiev, uh, for the war in Eastern Ukraine, saying that, uh, the people of Eastern Ukraine were not um willing to li live under the regime that was installed in kiev and that's why they're as he claimed fighting for their um uh, uh natural right to be uh, to for self-determination which is obviously pure russian bullshit part of my french um and on top of that he was uh he was an avid supporter of the occupation of crimea he even claimed as recently as 2017 or 2018 that crimea is ethnic russian land the reason i say ethnic because he didn't say rasiske he said ruske zemla which means ethnic russian land um and the only reason he claimed that he did not support the uh, the ratification of the annexation because he was not happy about the way the peninsula was obtained uh, he was perfectly fine with, uh, with the Crimean Peninsula being as part of Russia. Just, he was just not happy about the methods used. And now, he after the start of the full-scale invasion, um, it seems like he's trying to switch colors and he's trying to, again, score some political points and brownie points with the West, or with, uh, with the Ukrainians as well. And, well, not that many Ukrainians actually buy what he's saying, uh, because... I sense that he's also doing a lot of disinformation of his own. For example, uh, as far as I know, uh, he's the only person claiming that uh, he's the head of the National Republican Army. He is the only person who took credit for the assassination of Dugina. He is the only person who took credit for the assassination of uh, Maxim Fomin, Vladimir Tatarsky, uh, that happened last week. So, uh, overall, uh, I, I don't think he's any kind of true opposition. At best, he's an opportunist. At worst, he's another controlled figurehead.
And judging uh, by his tenure in the Russian state Duma, which spanned many years, and his many connections with the Russian security apparatus and the rest of the Russian government, it would suggest that he's not exactly the opposition figure you'd expect to be him to be. So uh, we can talk about the assassinations at a different uh, time, but I'll just say that assassinating someone like Daria Dugina or um, Maxim Fomin is a waste of perfectly good explosives, in my opinion. <laughs> there are much better targets in Russia. <laughs> We are yeah, having some fact, maybe no. problems with with internet. No, no, you're mm. good. We can see you. We can hear you. It's all good. Yep. It's all good. Uh, Madi, they... um, okay. He's definitely a no, guy. Um, you can still hear me and see me. Okay, maybe yes. Yes. Uh, yep. So Panamariov is still a shady guy. And um, yeah, a lot of people, a lot of people in the West um, told me, uh, especially um, recently, um, I got into a discussion with uh, an Italian Twitter that was like, he's true opposition because he was the only one voting against the annexation of Crimea. And I was like, mm, <laughs> who do you think allowed him to do so? Like you're in the ghost Duma, yeah. you don't do certain things without consequences. Yeah. It is even more yeah. important to, to, to notice that um, he is now a Ukrainian citizen. Again, he moved to Kyiv and he is now a Ukrainian citizen. But uh, a part of, uh, of Panamaryov himself, let's spend a few words about this Legion Svoboda Resi or National Republican Army. Uh, National Liberation Army, call it uh, as you want, uh, and also another group of um, of Russian volunteers inside uh, the Ukrainian military forces, which is RDK, which uh, which went public recently, which is uh, Ruski Dobrovolchiski Corpus, and. Um, Let's start with uh, with the Legion Svoboda Rasi. Um, for for what I can understand, uh, nobody saw them. Like we don't know what they are doing. Yeah, that's true. Um, uh, I don't want to. I don't want to undermine a Ukrainian operation if it is one, but that's what I feel. And it's a. Uh, it's a. Uh, what what in Ukraine or Russia would be called IPSO or uh, inf informational psychological operation. So if you have like a, a number of Russian citizens or Russian ethnic Russians who are fighting against the regular Russian army, of course it might undermine their motivation among amongst the regular Russian forces when they see like, hey, there's a fellow Russian against me. So it could be an effective tool. Uh, is it real? I don't know. Uh, we've never seen any faces, we've never seen any commanders, and the only person who took credit for uh, representing them or leading them is again Panamarov. Uh, so, apart from that, we don't have much to go on. With uh, Radeka, I think it's different. I think it's an actual formation that uh, ultimately did uh, materialize. Again, not enough is known yet, because, for example, we've got uh, from the ethnic Chechen side, we've got uh, the uh, Jahar Dudayev uh, battalion and we've got the Sheikh Mansur battalion. They've been around for years, uh, but for some reason, uh, media attention to them is minimal. But they've been fighting in Ukraine for years, since 2014, and they're still there. Um, so, I don't know. Uh, I guess we'll just have to wait and see with Bredeka, wait and see with the... Uh, 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 I don't think we're gonna have to wait and see. It's probably not real, <laughs> much like the NRA. Yeah, but it's worth noting that they are like self declared uh, declared Russian nationalists, like Ruski nationalists, not Rasiski. Again, 
like we saw two faces two people in some interviews and they openly declare that they are russian nationalists uh and they openly declare that, that they fight for the ukrainian army so this is interesting to put to put it mildly yeah i generally avoid pointing that out because you kind of got to circle back to a very prominent russian talking point that i'm not even going to mention <laughs> um yeah of but course. yes it makes sense. yes um uh, uh because at the end of the day it's like one of the russian talking points that's been discussed to death and then like i don't want to go back to it but um uh, yes it is extremely problematic uh i think i think one of the journalists who broke it broke, broke that part of the story in the west is christopher miller who himself is extremely problematic uh but he i guess he finally found what he was looking for in ukraine for the past eight years and the funny thing is that again it's not you it turned out to be not ukrainian but of russian origin so let's see. maybe he's finally doing the right work i don't know we'll see yeah of course so uh moving on um there are the, the 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 youtubers the the journalists again like uh yuri Dut, but also Ilya Varlamov. they uh maybe aren't like open opposition but they still uh at least um for what we know take a stance uh, of being against putin of being uh some sort of opposition at least if not leaders they give voice to to Russian opposition. So let's discuss the the major two of them. So yeah, Yuri Dut, for example. Yeah, um, you rightly pointed out they're they're not exactly opposition. They're not, they're not even political figures uh, at best. They're uh, they're political observers in the modern sense, uh, operating through social media and YouTube. So we've got Dut, we've got Varlamov, we've got Katz. For some reason, cuts just trying to break into politics, but keep in mind he's a YouTuber. Um, and we've got some smaller people, less prominent people like Michael Naki, and I'll I'll explain why I mention him. Um, so with Dutch Varlamov and cuts, and probably uh, it's the, mostly the case with uh, primarily the case with cuts. Um, they're not really concerned about the war in Ukraine per se. They're primarily concerned about the suffering of the Russian people. They're concerned about the effect of the sanctions. They're concerned about the corruption. Uh, but they not don't look into the root of the issue. To them, it is all a problem within a singular man or a singular group of people around as one man. Uh, but you don't get a nation of 140 million people going to, into a genocidal war at uh, the whim of just a handful of people. You need willing collaborators, uh, at least in a very a large section of the population, if not the majority. So are there, are there opposition uh, from a Russian perspective? Maybe. Are there, are there opposition in the way that people in the West would perceive them to be in reality when they, when they finally understand what they are? No. They're a competition. They're not opposition. They're competition to the current powers, and it just it doesn't just apply to them. It also applies to the actual political opposition figures that we've discussed before. Uh, so the reason I mentioned Michael Naki because he's an interesting one. Because out of all the people that we've just discussed, all the YouTubers, he's the only one who's was actually providing actionable advice on YouTube, saying. These are the legal repercussions, uh, and this is how you, legally you can avoid mobilization, and this is how you can flee the country. And he was explaining all of that. Uh, is he is he great and not problematic? No, of course people are flawed because he uh, he collaborates a lot with Popularna Politica, which makes me wonder why. And Popularna Politica is obviously a one of Navalny's channels on YouTube. Uh, the other one is obviously Navalny Lai. So, uh, but otherwise, and he collaborates with a with a very, very large number of other extremely problematic Russian opposition figures who are ultimately just Russian imperialists. So he's also an ex he, an ex echo analyst. If, echo if echo Moscow, yeah, 
you're right. Absolutely. So he came from this that same circle of uh, Russian liberals, so to speak, who are, who are financed by the federal government. So he's coming from the same yeah. kitchen, so to speak. Yeah. But it is worth noting. Uh, no, uh, go ahead. Yeah. Madi, is there anyone at all that you think, right, in Russia now yeah. that, let's say, besides wanting Putin and his circle, okay, and the people that are right up at the top to go, yeah. is there anybody at all that would at least come close? I would not perfect because there is no perfect, yeah. but that could come close to some of our values that we could look to and maybe follow and, and try to find out if they're not in jail already. Uh, one person does come to mind. Uh, of course, he's problematic and I'll explain what way, but he's done a lot of great work. Uh, Vladimir Karaburza. Um He's the person behind the, the list of names that got on Magnitsky's list. Of course, we've got Bill Bratter, who applied the necessary political pressure in the West and on the Hill in the United States to make it happen. But someone on the ground had to do, had to do all the work. And one of the people who did most of the work is uh, Vladimir Karamurza. Um, is he perfect? No, he's not. Uh, he's coming from the same circle as uh, Nemtsov. Uh, again, Nemtsov was a very good uh, opposition figure. Was he perfect? Of course not. No. Um, yeah. And uh, he's coming in in the footsteps of his father. Um, uh, his father had a lot of interesting connections as well because he worked for RTVI, the uh, the global Russian network, which is uh, like one for the Russian government, so <laughs> and so on and so forth. Uh, but at the end of the day, um, if you want to at least have some hope. Um, within Russia, I don't think anyone who's currently prominent or anyone who, definitely not anyone who's in power right now or even closely associated with the powers, it needs to be allowed to take any part in the formation of the so-called Russia of the future. Uh, a great example would be the Baltic uh, the states, uh, Estonia, Lithuania, and Latvia, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, where they apply the policies of lustration. Anyone who was linked with a communist government was not allowed to take part in the formation or the national dealings and politics of the newly independent countries. And I think the same needs to happen. Well, it's one of the necessary steps. One of the necessary steps in the Russia future would be to conduct full illustration, uh, make sure that anyone who's linked with the current Russian government, anyone who's part of the Russian government right now, anyone who's linked with the so-called opposition, and I'm sorry, the reason I mentioned it, because many of the opposition figures are simply coming out of the Russian government themselves. So anyone who's who was linked with the system, was part of the system, should not be allowed to take power or take part in the formation of the new system. And, I, and the reason I say it, um, it's one of the necessary steps because there are many other steps that need to happen before there's even a hope of a democratic Russia. At the end of the day, I don't think a democratic Russia is even possible within the uh, current borders of the, of the Russian Federation. But again, that's a topic for another day. Yeah, it's a big, that's a big one. Yeah. <laughs> it's a yeah. big topic. Yeah. No, because what we're looking at. Yeah, yeah. 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 I think what we're looking oh, at in the end, let's say from it's this has been a very, very slow process, probably starting, let's say 1917 is something that stopped the fall of the Russian Empire, something that happened in other areas of the world. Uh, we had the Hungarian, Austro-Hungarian Empire that fell. We had the Ottoman Empire that fell. We had the British Empire that fell. Uh, slowly, that had started its process, but the Russian Empire had not fallen. And it was just basically 1917 was a continuation under different means, used, sorry, under a different name, but using the exact same means. So if anything is to replace or if anything is to happen inside Russia where there's an awakening of some sort, 
it's going to take years and years and years, and they're going to have to come to some sort of realization. But I don't have the answers to that. It's just what we observe, right, over time. Yeah. Um, it could take years, yeah. and it could happen in an instant. And the reason I mention it, because we've got an example of 1991. Um, nobody thought that the Soviet Union was going to collapse in 88 or 89. Nobody thought that it was going to happen. Uh, of course, there were some, uh, well, more extreme political analysts, but anyone who lived within the Soviet Union uh, could not even um, uh, imagine such a scenario. But it did happen, and what people, many people don't realize that when the Soviet Union collapsed, within the Russian Federation itself, or RSFSR, uh, the uh, Russian Socialist Federative, uh, the Federal name of the Republic. Russian Federation, the name of the Russian Federation within the Soviet Union, within that uh, polity itself, there were many autonomous republics, and there are still many autonomous republics within the Russian Federation. Pretty much every single one of them declared independence. That's what many history books quite frequently omit to mention. Uh, the two that stuck around for the most are Chechnya, or the Chechen Republic of Echkeria, and Tatarstan. The rest of them were quickly pushed into signing a treaty of federation with Moscow, either through political pressure or through some concessions or through some political backroom deals or through straight up bribery. Most likely it was just bribery in many of those instances. Uh, many of those were frequently, uh, were very uh, quickly federated. But uh, Ichkeria and, and Tatarstan were the two toughest ones um and the reason i'm bringing it up because uh in 88 nobody thought it was going to happen and then uh, in 91 even the russian federation itself was very close to collapsing and that's why uh that's one of the reasons why the russians were so aggressive with the second with the first chechen war and the second chechen war it was not even about resources it was about people it was about the chechen people to make an example out of them and to show to the rest of the people of the Russian Federation that you cannot simply declare independence because this is what you get. You get death and you get genocide and you get the utter an an annihilation. So stay in line, stay, stay subservient to Moscow. Yeah, it's also um, very important noting that uh, the majority of the op um, opposition people that we discussed today, uh, they actively oppose what we call as balkanization or um, uh, like they oppose any change uh, in the Russian borders uh, as we know them today. We some support Crimean annexation, saying don't, but a part of Crimea, uh, almost all, pe all the people we discussed, except for Panamaryov, he is an active uh, fan, and, uh, yeah. at least from his words, from his deeds, it's probably a different, uh, different story. Uh, but there are uh, a few people uh, that uh, I, no, sorry. Uh, go ahead. He, yeah. he he also thinks that Lavrov is a lovely person. So that's uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, but yeah. Uh, there are still some notable people that uh, I would like to discuss briefly uh, because I see uh, it's getting uh, an hour and a half, and Monique has to go. So briefly, we yeah. didn't mention <laughs> Ilya Yashin. Yeah, Ilya Yashin is right. he uh, good? Bad, mm, mostly good. What do we know about him? He's not good. <laughs> anyway, he's he's a man of the system. He's an opportunist, and he 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 collaborates likely with the people who are uh, Kremlin proxies. And you don't have to go any further than his political speeches from two thousand eight, two thousand nine, two thousand ten. Even before the uh, the uh, the uh, the Russian uh, military interference in Ukraine, um, he took part in talk shows discussing the so-called Banderovtsi and the scary right wingers in Ukraine. Um, he also took part in political schemes where he would actively split the votes, uh, and I'm talking about the mayoral elections in Moscow, where uh, Gutkov Gutkov uh, Jr. was a representative of a unified opposition and everyone agreed upon that running against Sabanin and then last minute Yashin shows up as another candidate splitting the opposition votes so 
Uh, and uh, of course, we've got him getting a very lengthy prison sentence for uh, discrediting the armed forces of the Russian Federation. So, yeah, he was useful to the system, but then when he got annoyed, annoying to the system, they got rid of him. Uh, so, is he good? Uh, as good as it gets in Russia, I guess. Uh, but is he good in terms of uh, representing the two democratic ideals from the Western perspective? No. Okay, okay. And let's spend a few words um, about uh, the true bad guys, the bad guys that show actively that they are bad guys. I mean, um, those who oppose Putin, but uh, because they want it even harder, want even a more totalitarian regime in Russia. An example of this is Igor Girkin slash Strelkov. Uh, yep. There is um, in, in uh, Russian public opinion on Telegram, etc. Uh, lately, there are a lot of, of thoughts that those people will probably be the next one um, going to power in Russia. So, uh, yeah. So, yes. Wh what can uh, you say first about Stilkov and then so the rest? There's a lot of speculation that someone like Prigozhin or someone like Stilkov or even some crazier speculations that someone like Kadyrov is going to take over Russia. That's just not going to happen. Yeah. Um, so quickly about Strelkov. Uh, Igor Strelkov is a as a as an FSB colonel and a prominent Russian nationalist. He uh, he took part in many uh, Russian campaigns. He fought in the Balkans. He fought in Georgia. He fought in the Chechen wars, and he fought in in, in, in Eastern Ukraine, obviously before the full scale invasion. And he's an FSB colonel. Um, so he does what the center tells him to do. He doesn't have the will of his own. What people don't understand is that the the powers in the Kremlin and the structures of Siloviki are not a unified monolithic block. There are factions. And uh, one of the people that I mentioned before is Sergei Ivanov. Uh, I'm pretty sure he has a, a, a grudge against Putin specifically because he was supposed to be the, uh, the person who... Uh, it would have, would have it should have assumed the presidential seat uh, during the Medvedev Putin switcheroo, but Putin back then quickly realized mm -hmm. that Ivanov is a very dangerous guy. He's not someone who would have surrendered the presidential seat without a fight. So they picked Medvedev, someone who's considered to be a joke by many Russians and, and by by people in power in Russia. So, um, and when you have and and another example, of course, this is not this is not confirmed, and it's all just rumors. But the rumblings coming uh, from Moscow right now is that not everyone was displeased about Putin getting getting an international warrant. Uh, for example, Patroshev was actually very giddy about it because it presents him with an opportunity and a card to play if he wants to play it and use it to appease the West. Um, so. It's all a game of politics and an all a game of uh, backstabbing, so to speak. So when you have someone like Prigozhin, when you have someone like Girkin uh, be be becoming super vocal, expressing criticism of uh, Vladimir Putin, it's not because they, they are doing it of their own volition. It is likely that they're getting orders from the uh, various power circles within Russia uh, that want to achieve something in the moment. Um, because I'm pretty sure um, within the power circles, there are many of them who are not happy about, uh, not about the war, who are not happy about Putin, and they're, they're not happy about how he's conducting the war. So, yeah, or that they're, losing, the that they're losing exactly. cash abroad, right? Exactly. A lot of them are losing. I think yeah. that's more upsetting to a lot of them. Not yeah. so much. It's the loss of prestige for their own or that their kids can't go somewhere or yeah. uh, the yacht has been seized, yeah. their bank accounts have been seized. I don't think it has anything to do at all about yeah. Ukraine itself. They never yeah. talk about that. They never no, ever they actually care. mention it. They always mention that there's something, you no, know, oh, woe is me. Okay. Um, look at the suffering yeah. that we're going it, through. 
right? Yeah, it is. It is the so-called party of war, the party of Aini, which are the active supporters of even a, a harder line uh, inside the Russian government. So um, this um, will be my my last question. So um, do you think, Madi, that? Um, that those uh, talking heads like Strilkov, um, etc., and all those uh, Telegram uh, Z patriots, uh, they are, of course, part of the system. They are, of course, allowed to speak by the system, but not by Putin directly. Uh, maybe exactly. uh, by other people that want some regime change, obviously not yep. a democratic one, but some regime change that uh, maybe will put them in power. For example, Patrushev again, or Prigozhin, yeah. or somebody else. Yeah. So, so in, in some way, given that we're talking about opposition here, uh, in some way, uh, this kind of opposition to Putin is actually the most dangerous to Putin because they actually have the means to get rid of him and to topple him. Um, and they have a lot of means. I'm sorry, from financial ending, ending with... Uh, you know, with the actual brute force. Uh, that's why Putin has been changing his uh, FSO or the Federal Служба Охраны officers, the Federal uh, Security Service. Uh, those are the officers who are responsible for guarding his body. They have the primary access. Uh, so they, they get clearances that are even above anyone who's serving in the FSB or any other kind of intelligence service. And that's why he's done uh, those uh, switches multiple times already since the start of the full-scale invasion because he's paranoid he's afraid of the people who are the closest to him uh getting rid of him and judging by the rhetoric of someone like Sidokov okay. girkin someone like Pri even prigozhin at the time at some times um and many other uh, z telegram patriots um it seems that they are people uh, in the circles of power who would like to conduct the war in a very different way, and for that, for they need to get rid of Putin. Yeah, but uh, yeah. one one detail that I um, that I wanted briefly to um, to point out: Why do you think that, uh, for example, Kadyrov or Prigozhin couldn't uh, could not uh, get in power? I mean, if they have some degree of support from parts of Russian system, uh, why they couldn't get there? All right, so with Kadyrov, it's easy. Uh, he speaks Russian yeah. with a thick Chechen accent. Russian is not his native language. He's an ethnic uh, Chechen, um, specifically someone like uh, Patrushev um, hates his guts because the two were on the opposing sides of the first Chechen war. Um, and essentially, he's there's no hope. Uh, he's he's sworn an oath of lo loyalty, personal oath of loyalty to Putin specifically, and the moment Putin loses power, uh, Kadyrov will have to find a way to either flee the country or he's going to quickly perish himself as well. With Prigozhin, um, he's a he's a criminal. Uh, he's a, and by criminal I mean he's a convicted convicted felon. Um, he, he's, a, he's a man of the system in a, in a, in a way where he's an errands boy. Uh, sorry for calling him that, but that's what he is. Uh, he, he's not someone who's taken seriously. Uh, he's someone who's uh, good at executing orders. Um, and that's why he was even allowed to have all those catering contracts in the first place. That's why he was allowed to have... Uh, the uh, the control uh, the control over the financing of the uh, the so-called PMC Wagner operations, and that's why he's so vocal right now because he wants to show that to the uh, future uh, bosses that he could be a useful tool and a useful um, uh, servant to whomever is actually going to take power after Putin. He doesn't. He's not so prominent in the in the media space right now because he wants to have a bit at, at the seat in the Kremlin. Uh, he's smarter than that. He knows that he's got no hope. Uh, if he tries anything, they'll just kill him. Uh, because yeah, at the end of the day, that's how it works in Russia. Uh, but he wants to make sure that whoever has got a decent chance of taking the presidential seat considers to him to be a useful actor. And as long as he's useful, he's going to live and he's going to have 
of the whatever riches he managed to accumulate over the years. Uh, Strelkov Girkin, I just don't hate him seriously. He's just a talking hand and he's a terrorist and uh, he's an FSB uh, colonel. So uh, I wouldn't be surprised if yeah. at some point in the future he's going to experience the same fate as Dugina and he experience the same fate as Tatarsky because uh, it was, as I said before, it's it's not the Ukrainians who are killing them. It's I, I, I'm pretty sure it's the Russians doing it because they're just want to send the right signals through the uh, through the power circles that there's only one game in town and it's whoever is uh, pulling the trigger. Uh, I yeah. just wanted or, to... Uh, even, uh, Monique? Yeah, I just wanted to point out two things. One, to, to, exp to add to what Mandy was saying with all of these little groups we're seeing a lot of, and this has probably been this case for a very long time, all of, let's say, people who have real money. You know, today there was an important article that came out uh, about um, Altushkin, uh, who has his Euro Battalion, for example, and he spent quite a lot. And this is also going on at the top levels where you have a lot of people who are starting to arm up. Um, smaller units and, and different things like that. And the one thing that I agree, Madi, 100% is that these people are useful. This is something that, you know, we, we look at things in a different way, but I can understand how, okay, this, is, this person is useful for the regime right now. Okay, not useful, jail or, or kill the person and that's it, okay? I know it's very cold, but this is what we're seeing. Another thing I also wanted to point out, there's an there's a, on the FSO, there's a great article that came out um, through the Dossier Center. Uh, I've republished it. I don't know a lot about the person, but I read through the article. Okay, if this person is sincere, he's an ex-FSO officer uh, that had that has oh, left. I just wanted to mention. Ryan Ray. Yeah, Kar Karakulov. Karakulov. Yeah, Karakulov. That's it. And um, I don't know. I don't, the veracity of the article, his words, whatever happened, will have to be verified. The Dossier Center has brought out, okay, the story. So I read through the whole thing. And in fact, it seems, you know, what exactly what you guys are saying, the FSO is is a very, um, it's, it's, it's the forces that are around Putin and a lot of the higher-ups. Uh, so it was interesting. One thing in the article, if anybody wants to read it, please go and find it because it's fascinating. It's a long article, but it's very, it's fascinating. Is that each of the people... There was an interview they, on YouTube. Also on YouTube, okay. Yeah, I don't know. And yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, I don't understand Russian, so... <laughs> even with uh, the... Even with the uh, they have subtitles. No. They have very good yeah, English good. subs. Yeah, Yeah, they're good. Okay, then I'll, wa then I'll watch it. I'll watch it. But I read the whole article and uh, long read. Okay. But the one thing that was very interesting from the whole thing was that around Putin and around all of the people and whenever they have events, it's the protection is extended to everybody that is at this event. And all they have to do is show up for five minutes, take a photograph and leave. And then they have a vacation for two weeks, okay, where everything is, I'll say it in Italian, alle spese della, dello Stato. So it's very yeah. interesting. Was it, I do invite people to go and read it. If it is disinformation, let's say, or in some sort of information operation, I can't say right now whether that is. I'd have to see what other experts are saying by how he, you know, what he actually says. So this is something interesting to, to look at. And I got to go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I'll say goodbye to everybody now. You guys can continue. I'm sure that there's a, a few questions, Alexei. Alexei, thank you very much for yeah. allowing me to thank sit you. into this really great discussion. Uh, you know, I always learn a lot. And um, uh, and that's it. And Mari, I'll see you around. <laughs> thank you, Monique. Bye, Thanks guys. again. Bye. So, Maddi, um, I was just thinking that there is one uh, very big player that we uh, forgot to mention, which is Kasparov. Yes. Yes. Again, I was for what that do we know about him? Yeah. yeah. 
So Gary Kasparov, uh, he's been an, uh, an outspoken critic of Putin specifically for the past uh, 15, 20 years. You cannot take away that from him. Uh, th there's, uh, there's also suggestions that he's been actively trying to help Ukraine and working on various proposals since 2014, 2015, um, and even more so since the start of full-scale invasion. But he kind of uh, falls folly to the same common problem uh, that is endemic in Russia. He fails to recognize that Russia is an empire, that Russia, um, Russia um, conducted a, pretty, a colonial war in Chechnya. Uh, he, he fails to recognize that uh, whatever's happening in Transnistria, for example, is another Russian colonial expansionist operation. Uh, of course, he like, somewhat is supportive of the idea that uh, parts of Georgia needs, uh, that are occupied by the Russians right now need to be reincorporated because it's somewhat related to Putin, but at the same time, not really, because I think he's in some way he believes that it's actual separatism by the Abkhazians and South Ossetians. Uh, in reality, it's just another Russian op. Um, so he's like he's a mixed bag, and then like you have to look into the his his history before the uh, before the collapse of the Soviet Union. He was a member of the Communist Party. Um, he, of course, he was a prominent uh, chess grandmaster, and uh, one could argue that he couldn't really travel and he couldn't really be so prominent without being a member of the Communist Party. Uh, but it kind of uh, sours the uh, it sours the mood, you know, uh, because as I said before, I'm a true I'm I'm kind of a believer that if you really want to move on from your past from a political standpoint, you need to conduct full illustration, much like the uh, uh, Estonian and Lithuania did. And if you have someone who's yeah. a member of the Communist Party still lingering around and operating, it's a problem, I think. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you. It is, it is important to say that even in Baltic states, there are still some uh, small chunks of corruption, even after the last election, to give an example of how difficult of a process it is. But yeah, um, in the end, I agree with you. Uh, need illustration. If we ever will see a democratic Russia, uh, as you uh, fairly pointed out, it will probably have different borders from what we we know now uh but yeah the the main things will uh will have to be lustration uh, exclusion and uh, and trial for uh, all the people from the system all those who who were close to the system uh so it's getting uh an hour and almost two hours so yeah yeah Thanks a lot for this conversation, Madi. Um, thank you for for accepting our invitation. It was uh, it was super interesting. I hope our uh, our viewers will find it interesting too. And um, if we will have maybe uh, some other occasions to to discuss uh, what's going on uh, in Russia, it would be my honor. Thank you, Alexis.